Welcome to Intimacy Play, a podcast by Pleasy Play. We host open discussions with world-leading experts on couples, sex, and intimacy, so you can build a more exciting, fun, and intimate relationship. I'm your host, Michaela Silva. Hello, everyone. Today, we have Eva with us. She is a queer sexuality educator and sex scientist communicator, and she's talking to us from Canada. How are you, Eva? I'm good. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much. So tell us a little bit more about yourself. What does it mean to be a queer sexuality educator? So part of that is like, I do a lot of my education from my own lived experiences. And I'm very passionate about supporting the queer community and uh, giving folks sex ed that they probably didn't get in school or didn't get other places. Um, Yeah. And I'm also like, always come from the point of like critiquing the cis heteronormative idea of sexuality and these scripts that we are given and kind of helping people broaden their mind and their idea of sex and sexuality. That's amazing. Can you just, you know, dig a little bit deeper into what cis normalization is or what what this means? Because I know what it is, but a lot of people don't. Yeah. So when I talk about the cis heteronormative uh, idea of sexuality, it basically means that we are taught that sex happens between a man and a woman and the man has a penis and a woman has a vagina and the sex that they have just the two of them uh that is sex and usually it's sex is penetrative sex but we know that sex and sexuality is like so much more than that there are all different people different gender identities different sexual orientations different ways to have sex different ways to express intimacy um so that's basically what that means thank you for you know for making it so simple to understand because it's like you said sex education is not been very well taught at schools Mm -hmm. and there is that type of cis mentality you know that that's the only normal type of uh sexuality and and that's so wrong yeah can you tell me a little bit more of why why you have an interest in this field so why are you a self-confessed sex research nerd (laughs) yeah so i'm a big nerd in general um and I was going, I did my undergrad in like a general science program. And as I was like coming into my own sexual journey, I was realizing that there is a whole community. There's a whole field of study where people like study sex and they ask people questions and they collect data and they analyze it and there are theories and just like my general nerdiness um, and my own like exploration of my own sexual identity just came together and I was like, this is amazing. And nobody knows about it because academic like papers are so like they're behind a paywall. And I'm like, oh my God, everybody deserves access to this knowledge. I love it. And you know, even when you said, you know, you are a self-confessed nerd, everybody's probably thinking, oh, she uses glasses or she's this or like that. No, you are a completely normal, beautiful, amazing woman that just likes reading and searching for things. That's amazing. (laughs) <laughs> I love it. Oh my gosh. It just to jump in here in, in the name of education. Yeah, I use she, they pronouns and I don't feel super tied to being a woman. So person is great. Educator is great. We're still figuring stuff out, but yeah. Thank you for telling me that. It's, yeah, no really, it's really easy to just, you know, associate somebody and say it's a woman, but no, it's a person. Mm-hmm. And I agree. And it's something that we have to get used to it. And I know it's maybe not easy for you to correct people, but I'm super happy when people correct me because I'm, I'm always learning in a better way to approach sexuality and to talk to people. Yeah, I think like since I started in this space too, I had like very long hair. I was like very feminine looking. Like when I started in this space, I identified as straight. Um, so I feel like I like on this journey had this ability to like bring people in who are like, oh, like, She's kind of this like straight femme, unassuming type of person. And as I've gotten gayer, they've been like, oh, I will also be learning new things about uh, sexuality. So if I can do that, then I'm happy to do that. Oh, of course. So you are a box full of surprises. From what <laughs> I understand, you've just published an ebook, mm-hmm. and it's called A Compassionate Guide to Sexuality and COVID 19. So can you tell us a little bit more about this ebook and what people should expect on it? 
Yeah. So as someone who, yeah, like is a big sex research nerd, I love sharing uh, studies and facts. I was seeing this like need and this struggle among my community of people like having difficulty navigating their sexuality in COVID. And I was like, I have this information and this data that might be helpful for you and like help provide you like a context and understanding to what's happening with your sexuality. And that's why I wrote the ebook. And what should people expect when they read this book? So who is the type of person that's looking for this book? Is it everyone? Is it people that are struggling with a specific thing? Yeah, so it's mostly, so I have lots of sections in the ebook about uh, sex drive. So if you are struggling with low sex drive, that's one thing. Um, if you are wanting to like mix things up, if you have maybe been with your partner and closed in the same area for several months on end, or if you're just by yourself and you're like, I have masturbated all the ways I think I can masturbate, like this is getting very tiring. What do I do? And also, I talk a lot about sexting. So if you want to dip your toe into sexting or virtual sex as a way to feel connected, that is also uh, an awesome person you should check out the book. So very specific tips on how to have a better sexuality. I love that. Yeah. And also around like the compassionate guide is really around being like your sexuality might look very different right now because we're in a very different world. Like there's this huge stress on us all the time. We are working from a different place. Like our kids might be at home. You might be more isolated. So if you feel disconnected from your sexuality or you feel like things aren't normal or what they typically are, like that is okay. <laughs> and then giving people tools to like enhance that if they wish. Thank you for myself and for everybody that's going to benefit <laughs> from this book, uh, which by the way, I am going to buy. I haven't read it yet, but I will. <laughs> you on your Instagram account, you know, digging a little bit deeper into the identity part that you just said, you know, some people don't identify or identify with something different than others perceive them. Uh, so in your Instagram, you talk about losing your queer virginity. What do you think that can be done to move the conversation around virginity and somebody's first sexual experience away from that cis centric normative? Yeah, I mean, I think really like expanding the definition of sex and also like letting people know that you get to define what different sexual experiences mean for you. Like if something feels like sex to you, then it is sex. Um, I think also like representation is really big. I know everybody was really stoked about Bridgerton on uh, Netflix. I don't know if you've watched it, but I, but I, I did. Yeah. But I was hearing like so many of the sex scenes are very like heteronormative, like penis and vagina five minutes and then both people have an orgasm apparently and I was like this is I I feel like this is kind of propaganda this is kind of telling people that their sex should only look this way and I feel like we've passed the need for that I want to see all different kinds of sex in movies in tv um so yeah disrupt that very narrow idea I do understand that point of view. I did watch Bridgeton and I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. There's actually one thing, one of the scenes that I most enjoyed was when they actually portrayed a, a gay scene. So a man on man. And that's really, I really like that because especially in those times, it was a lot of taboo and they were, I think they were mm -hmm. trying to bring that out. So I, I saw it as a positive. Yeah. On the negative side, yes. A person that has never had sex before. So in this case, it was the main character. She was a virgin and, you know, having an orgasm the very first time in a penetration that's so not normal it makes it seem like everybody should be having that so yeah mm -hmm. i think that should be at least a disclaimer around that yeah like this is one type of experience but when we've yeah when we've seen that everywhere about time to show some different stuff and i agree yeah like having more like queer sex in tv is awesome something that you know is not talked about is also fetishes and do you think that's that's something that should also be talked about and make it normal? And what does it mean to be normal in a, in a fetish world? Yeah, I mean, I think there's been like more media around like BDSM and like kinky sexuality. And I think that's really awesome. Oh, I'm sounding like a broken record here. But I think it really does tie back to the idea of like expanding what our definition of sex is. And like, you don't have to be into everything but there are a lot of different ways to like relate to sexuality um and for some people that is in a kinky way for some people um 
if they do have specific fetishes, then that's part of it too. Thinking about broadening the way that, you know, people talk about sex and view it, Mm -hmm. you think it's broad enough when we're talking about sex and people with disabilities, or is that something that still is marginalized within the discussions around sexuality? Yeah, I think there's still a lot of like sexual ableism and just people with disabilities and disabled people get left out of conversations about sexuality a lot. Um, my friend Andrew Gerza runs a podcast called Disability After Dark. Um, and yeah, he really talks a lot about how people make a lot of assumptions about his genitals, feel really entitled to ask questions about uh, the way he has sex and his body and yeah i think like we still very much uh desexualize disabled people and don't see them as potential sexual partners uh when that's not true like disabled people can be just as sexual or not sexual as able-bodied people to me it makes total sense and i, I was reading an article by alice uh, brewster and she was saying that because she is bisexual she was saying that when she is in a relationship with a woman everybody feels the need to ask how it is and how she does it Mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden when she's with a man nobody asks about that so why is that there shouldn't be a duality yeah that the like norms go unquestioned oh man (laughs) Michaela don't get me asking straight people because I want to be like yeah how's it going how's it going with you but yeah, it's really like violating to be like, okay, so you're part of a marginalized group and therefore you are not entitled to your privacy about your sexuality or your relationship or your body, uh, which is really not cool. It's about consent, isn't it? If you feel that you shouldn't talk about that or ask somebody that's straight, then don't do it with anybody else. They're exactly the same as you are. Yeah, and I think it's kind of like, I don't know if it's like a a punishment basically being like kind of like a way of keeping people in line like okay so we're gonna her it's like it's a form of harassment like because you don't conform to this very narrow definition of a sex uh yeah i hope not <laughs> i hope that's not the point i really do yeah because i hope it's just out of curiosity and People just don't understand that that can be hurtful to somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know, curiosity has its limits. So let's leave it like that. If you don't ask your mom and dad what they do or with your your dad and your dad and your mom and your mom, you know, don't ask anybody else as well. Yeah. I mean, I think it's I think it's definitely subconscious. And like ask the queer sex educators. I am I am consenting. I have a whole video on my YouTube channel called How Do Lesbians Have Sex? So if you had questions, (laughs) I got you. So if anybody has a question, just watch the video, please. Yeah, there we go. So on a positive note, I'm not going to start on a positive note this question, but (laughs) this has been a hard year for everybody, you know, with COVID and lockdowns. Do you have any suggestion on how to make uh, sexuality positive with all of this happening around us? What tips Mm -hmm. do you have for somebody in a relationship or not, you know, to have a good sexuality within these times? Yeah, it has been a really tough year. For sure. I think one, letting go of those kind of like expectations around sexuality. Like if you're having this feeling like, oh, I need to be having sex with my partner like X amount of times per week or X amount of times per month or like our relationship is bad and you're getting all stressed about that. I would be like, let go of that expectation (laughs) Um, and like move towards like pleasure and intimacy. Um, And that can be just like like cuddling if you want to cuddle like have a bath together if you want to do that like if you are single being like investing in some porn that's really affirming for you and like giving yourself that time to explore yourself yeah moving moving towards pleasure in like a low stakes low pressure type of way and do you have any specific tips on how to do that so for example i have two kids at home all the time (laughs) yeah so you know is it making the time for that how do we make it a priority Yeah, I mean, I think just like you are not an expert on queer sexuality, I am not an expert on being someone who has kids and sexuality. Um, But yeah, I would say like making it a priority. I was talking to, um, I was having another conversation about like having date nights, which seems like a kind of maybe a cliche tip of advice, but like the actual process of being like, okay, it's in the calendar. I'm going to have this time to like make myself 
feel cute. Like you are like slowly getting your body ready for whatever like type of intimacy you might want to have. And that prioritization, I think can be, can be powerful. And if physical distance is an issue right now, so you have people at, that are together 24 seven for long periods of time, mm -hmm. and that is a problem right now. You also have the other half of the problem, which is, you know, I, I actually have somebody, but there is a distance and I can't be with that person. Any mm -hmm. tips on that, on how to make it spicy and sexy? Yeah. I mean, I think like sexing and virtual sex and phone sex is, is all really awesome. Uh, for folks who like getting on FaceTime or Zoom and having sex might seem a little bit like much right off the top. Love phone sex. Just like do a little mutual masturbation and just like listen to each other's noises on the phone that can be like you don't have to say anything but it is still like intimate um and you're still like having sex with each other um there are also lots of cool sex toys that you can use like distantly um you can ask your partner and give them be like these are the sex toys that i was thinking of using tonight would you like to pick which one i would use that's a way of like feeling connected through long distance I'm loving those tips. So if you <laughs> haven't got anything planned for tonight, you know, start thinking about what to do. I think we've got it covered. <laughs> Being a sex educator, I'm sure that a lot of people struggle and, and talk to you about body image. And can you tell us a little, a little bit more of how can people pass that? So how can people have a positive body image for themselves? I've been thinking about this recently and I feel like I've gotten to a point where I've cultivated, whether it's like love for my body or like a neutrality for my body, like this is the body I got. It does things for, does things for me. We are not at war. I feel like I'm at that point kind of out of spite um, <laughs> because I feel like capitalism wants me to hate my body and like diet culture wants me to hate my body. Like there are people invested in me thinking that I need to lose weight, that I need to be hairless, that I need to like look all these certain ways and they make money off of me feeling like crap about things that are like, this is how my body is naturally. Like I'm, the only reason I think I need to change it is because they've convinced me that I need to change it. So I feel like I'm at a point where I'm kind of like, No, <laughs> I don't know you. Why should your opinions dictate how I feel about my body? Um, and that, and then also TikTok, and then just like following so many hot fat people um, has kind of like reconditioned my brain to be like, what is this lie that I believe that there's only one way to be hot? Because like humans look so many different ways and like it doesn't even make sense that it, there would only be one way to be hot. There's so many, like, they're all different kinds of ways. So do you think that, you know, having a positive body image mm -hmm. is something that can be helped with knowing more about different cultures and people and bodies and mm -hmm. types of sexuality as well? Yeah, I think definitely like having some of that perspective because um, we're like inundated with messages about like this one ideal type of body, but that one ideal type of body changes all the time like that ideal in like the 2000s is very different than it was now and the ideal in like the like 70s and 60s and 50s like was very different so yeah getting that perspective on like this changes all the time so it's not real um yeah and looking at yeah different cultures different people um yeah and really take being able to see like the beauty in diversity of bodies i feel like yeah it could definitely help cultivate some like self-compassion towards your own body apart from yourself which i would love to for you to say where everybody can follow you <laughs> who are other people that you can suggest you know anybody that's feeling they have like a low self-esteem or a bad body image that they can follow you know and and get in the mood of understanding that they're unique as well Yeah, I love I love Don Sarah. Uh, she recently retired her podcast, but there are 300 episodes of the Sex Gets Real podcast. Um, and yeah, she answers a lot of questions from folks who are like navigating fat phobia and like sex in a fat body. And that's amazing. Also, Erica Hart, who is I Heart Erica on Instagram. Uh, they recently did an interview with, I think it's Glamour. I don't know if I still have it up on my computer. 
No, I don't. Um, but they for their self love issue, um, and Erica's comments about beauty and self love, like especially in that interview. Mm, please send it to me. Yeah, I will. I'll, yeah, we can put it in the show notes or something. But it was really, it was really awesome. And thinking about again that you know body image, if you could change something in mainstream media, what would it be? You know, to help uh, mm-hmm. people have a better representation of different body types. Yeah, more black and brown bodies, more disabled bodies, more fat bodies. I just want like fat people falling in love. Like that would be great. Like I feel like we're at the point right now where it's like maybe there can be like a fat character on a TV show, but they're like a side character. And I'm like, no, they deserve love, love romance. <laughs> You know, I was actually born in Africa. I was born in Mozambique and mm. I lived a lot of my life in Mozambique and uh, also a few good years in Angola. And the body image in Africa, and I'm generalizing, I've, I have a very specific uh, experience in, in two countries, is so different than in Europe. Mm-hmm. And that is, you know, if you are a little chubbier, if you have a little bit of meat here and there, that's really what everybody's looking for because it shows that, you know, that you eat, that you like having uh, a good time and that you, there's some place to be grabbed on. So mm-hmm. it's really interesting that it is cultural. Yeah, totally. Oh, I love that. I love it. And it's it's something that really... It didn't shock me when I started living in Europe because mm-hmm. most of my life was lived in, in Africa. It didn't shock me because obviously I, I did travel a lot to, to Europe having family here as well. But it did make me sad how yeah. much culture was affecting, you know, my friends and their body image mm-hmm. just because they didn't fit the model type version that nobody actually does except for people that are in that industry. <laughs> yeah. Their body's type is like, it's about wearing the clothes on the runway. And somehow we've decided that like that specific body type is the best for displaying clothes on a runway. Um, but it's like, yeah, if you're not a model, that's not what you're doing. The, like, <laughs> the, the, the does, doesn't have any relation to like your actual life. I respect the modeling profession so much. Mm-hmm. I would just love that when, you know, stylists were doing clothes, they would think that it's not the models that are going to use the clothes. It's average people that have different types of bodies and it's going to mm-hmm. suit them differently. Anyway, something that we are always very keen on understanding is any tips that you can give to everyone of how to keep your relationship open. So is there something that you can suggest people to, you know, make it exciting and open? Ooh, Open, do you mean like open communication, like about what you like? Or- I mean, what do you want? So I love having a broad question because everyone understands it in a different way. So it gives me Ooh. a lot of different perspectives. That's so cool. Yeah, my brain immediately thinks of open communication about desires and stuff. Um, I love a, love like a weekly or a monthly check-in with a partner about how things are going. Um things that maybe want to improve, exciting things that we want to prioritize maybe. Yeah. I love that weekly, like debrief kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also love, love a want, will, won't list where you just like write down all the things that you want to do sexually that you are like fine with doing. And then the things that you won't do Um, and exchanging that with the partner. I feel like that can be a very fun way of like talking about your desires and what you want and like getting that conversation started. Thinking about that, you know, I had never heard about that type of list, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. But if somebody would give me a list saying, you know, I don't want this, wouldn't it be interesting to discuss not only why they don't want that, but above all, why not try it and then say they don't want, I don't know, just food for thought. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I think people place a different value on exploration in their sexuality. Like, I think some people are like, I want to try everything once. Um, And some people are really like, I know that this is what I like and that's it. And I think it can be helpful to like, that's a certain amount of compatibility that hopefully like maybe both partners would have a certain level of understanding of how much they want to explore. I mean, there's also like people have hard boundaries around stuff around like sexual trauma um, or yeah, just stuff that like p- bad past experiences. Um, and sometimes they just have stuff they don't like. True, completely. And how to keep the relationship exciting? I don't know. I mean, I feel like having these conversations about what 
you like and what, yeah, turns you on is awesome. And also like doing that own exploration for yourself. Like I think um, having that like time away to explore porn or like reflect on what you like or like have other like, um, I don't know, just like experience things out in the world and then like bringing back those new experiences and curiosities can be really awesome well i have a friend in toronto who runs a sex variety show she can't do it obviously now because of covid um but there are like burlesque performers and like erotic like poetry and i just want to be like oh i feel like all couples should like (laughs) i feel like that would be so amazing to like go to something like that together and like be exposed to a bunch of new ideas that can be a really cool way to keep things spicy so it's like exploring different senses in sexuality as well you know looking listening hearing yeah yeah and just like learning new things and like hearing about other different people's sexualities and like even if you don't vibe with everything you can it can give you like stuff to stuff to ponder whether it reinforces what you know what you like or can like inspire new ideas and you know last question of putting you in the spot how do you keep your relationship intimate yeah, really like broadening your definition of what like intimacy is. Like there are lots of different things that in like environments and situations that inspire vulnerability um, and like new situations whenever you're like sharing feelings with a partner. Yeah, that can spark intimacy. Eva, for everybody that wants to learn more about sexuality, about science, about sex, where can they find you? So folks can find me on Instagram at what's my body doing. Um, I'm also on YouTube. What's my body doing? And uh, yeah, on my website at evabloom.ca. By the way, I've seen Eva's content, obviously, and (laughs) I love the videos. I think you are so open, but at the same time, very precise with what you're talking. So it's not just fun. You Mm -hmm. learn a lot of things. So It's the person to follow if you want to learn more, be more open, and understand better everybody's sexuality. Thanks, Kim. Eva, (laughs) thank you so much for being with us. It was amazing. Hopefully, you can, you know, give us news with new things that you're doing very soon. Mm -hmm. Give us a shout out. Mm -hmm. And yes, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much. (laughs) And that was Intimacy Play. We hope you enjoyed it. To find out more about Pleasy and how we can take your relationship to the next level, visit pleasyplay.com. Then also make sure to search for Intimacy Play in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found, and click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Pleasy, thank you for listening.